Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. Is there a constitutionally acceptable way of regulating speech? Today I will be joined by Richard Delgado, who teaches law at the University of Alabama School of Law, where he holds the John J. Sparkman Chair of Law. Professor Delgado taught previously at UCLA and the University of Colorado. He's the author of many articles and books in the area. Most recently, Must We Defend Nazis? Why the First Amendment Should Not Protect Hate Speech and White Supremacy. I'm very excited to have Richard Delgado today on the podcast. He's a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law where he's the John Sparkman Chair, and he has written several books that are very pertinent to this topic with his wife, Jean Stefanschit, and most recently has come out with a book called Must We Defend Nazis? But before that, you've written for a very long time books in this area of both First Amendment law, of speech, of hate speech regulation, and then also critically important critical race theory, the Derek Bell Reader, and other volumes. So you've been in this conversation for quite a while, and they've really shaped it significantly. So first of all, thank you, Richard, for joining me today on this podcast. So welcome. I'm very glad to be part of it. You had written a book in the mid-90s, I think, on sort of the questions of regulating hate speech and how to address that properly. And you proposed a way to actually regulate hate speech in society that is constitutionally sound, but also socially responsible. And then you've, you and your wife, you've just reissued or updated or written actually a newer version of this book for probably addressing the current debates in which we find ourselves right now. Yes, and the, the new book has a new title, as you might expect. It's uh, Must We Defend Nazis? Question mark. Why the... First Amendment should not protect hate speech and, and white, white supremacy. It just came out by NYU U Press, and uh, Jane Stefanczyk is, is indeed the, the co-author. It contains quite a bit of, of new material compared to the, the first edition, which came out some years ago. You wrote this book because you feel there is still a need for an argument to be made that there is a constitutionally sound way to actually think about especially hate speech, that isn't really entirely resonating with all parts of public debate. It's resonating very, very, very well with uh, parts of the, the public, others not. I might say that that the most vocal opponents of regulating hate speech, at least on the on the law side, have been the, the ACLU, which I, I just read in the paper, thanks to a a leak of a memo from that, that organization, is reconsidering its position. It's more or less absolutist position that it's maintained since since the beginning, that hate, hate speech is beyond regulation. Now they're starting to talk over whether it might well be and, and, and whether the organization should now consider more, more carefully the equality position than it has done in the, in, in the past and, and make accommodation for it. As well it might. For example, the press today is, is under a serious attack by, by the administration in a way it, it hasn't been for a very, very long time. The administration calls the press purveyors of fake news, of false accounts. Uh, it calls them a bunch of, of liars without conscience, criticize it, stand in the, in the way of what it wants to accomplish misleads the American people. In one way of looking at it, the press now are the subjects of hate speech. It's very easy to see the power of hate speech and to see the need for some sort of remedy for it if it's your ox that's being gored. For a very long time, <clears throat> the, the press has more or less had, it, had its way as it should. 
in, in our society. And the, the ACLU has been able to muster quite a bit of indignant and highly you know, theoretical cerebral support for its position that, that nothing should stand in the way of an absolutist unfettered for First Amendment. But now it's beginning to recon, reconsider that, that, that position as it should. It's interesting that you're saying, you're pointing out that the, the press, which tends to adopt a very absolutist position, I think sometimes conflating freedom of the press with freedom of speech and with academic freedom and saying it all is one thing and defending itself, actually, its own principles. And what you're saying is that now the press is under severe attack and is rethinking maybe even the way in which free speech is used is maybe not sincere on all sides. There's the first part that it's a concept people use as an, a complete abstraction, but you're saying it now touches organizations or the press or institutions that had been somewhat immune to that. I'm saying it. I'm not saying that until now they haven't been sincere in their support of a more or less absolutist view of, of, of the First Amendment, free, free speech clause. I think they were probably sincere in, in that. I've had a, a number of debates with the ACLU, whose position is very close to that of most journalists. And I believe that they, they've been completely sincere in, in their position. But what I'm saying is that they're now beginning to reconsider that, that position. Right, and that's recent. And if we look at the ACLU sort of from Skokie and from the 70s and to today, there's a, there was already a big challenge in the 70s that a lot of people actually disagreed with their decision to litigate on behalf of the neo-Nazis and to take that cause up. Now they're going through a similar kind of reckoning, we'll see, you know, because even back in the 70s, a lot of people left the ACLU and didn't quite think it was an absolute victory for free speech, but also felt it was a compromise on equality. So the sincerity is there. Can you say a little bit about, and you outlined this in your book really well, you say there's different arguments for justifying leaving hate speech untouched, not regulating it at all. Oh, about 10 of them. My co-author and I give them names. About five of them, as you know, you've, you've read the book, emanate from the liberal or neoliberal liberal side. Right. These are very familiar arguments. Probably the most common one is that the best answer to speech that we don't like, that speech that we hate, is more speech, speech that cuts the other way. But there are a number of others. As you know, speech as a, a safety valve, a pressure valve, more along that, those lines. And there are about five that you hear recurrently from the, uh, sort of from the right, from the conservative position. We name them, we analyze them, we show what's wrong with them. Some have a grain, grain of truth, one can see that. But a, a significant portion of our, our book deals with these, these arguments, these policy arguments for the other side's uh, position and shows that they don't go nearly as far as their proponents think they go. It's important to, today to take account of these, these policy arguments because the absolutist argument that the First Amendment simply brooks no limits on the hate speech it is beginning to weaken in the face of the advance of, of legal, legal realism. It used to be that the, that the argument against speech regulation was a non-starter because of, of the many kind of wooden mechanical uh, tests that courts would use when speech came under attack, as they saw it. But now that that legalistic approach is weakening and, and you can get judges to consider whether that sort of thinking leads to the right results, the conversation has now turned to policy arguments. And so we spend a fair amount of time in our book to, to dissection of them. Right. Can you say a little bit more about this kind of legal, there had been a tendency, what you call a mechanistic or kind of wooden interpretation of what does it give way to? Is it a more context aware, a more nuanced understanding how speech actually plays out in different contexts and moving away from this rigid understanding, imminent threat of credible violence that a reasonable observer would classify as such. So this shift is something you've been in the law school for a long time, so you see this today. What is the different approach, not this kind of formalism anymore, but more of a realism? 
It's just starting to come in in the First Amendment, which is has been the, the last sort of holdout. Almost all, all areas of, of law, family law, for, for example, have mo- moved away from the approach that relies on formulas and cliches and is, is willing to consider sociological consequences of divorce, for example, beginning to consider whether there should be different kinds of marriage contract. Uh, an, an approach that opens th- things up and that looks at the real world consequences of a legal rule. This approach, which is called legal realism, entered the law starting around 1920 and has completely revolutionized and humanized most fields of law, like contracts law, consumer protection law, even tax law. But the one area that has been slowest to move in this direction is the First Amendment. Other areas of constitutional law have, but this one area hasn't. So it's been a a very easy thing to be a defender of of hate speech and and to argue against hate speech rules no longer. And could we look at two of those arguments so that have been made that you list in your book? You say there's five, roughly speaking, sort of neoliberal arguments, five neoconservative, and the neoliberal ones are as you said but a couple of minutes ago, it's a pressure valve. It lets people blow off steam. So then they get this racism out, and then presumably we all move along. It's oh, yes. That's indeed the pressure valve argument. Gene and I include it in our book, although the, the first article with pressure valves and bloody chickens in the, <laughs> in the title yes. was written by myself. And David Yun, Y-U-N, one of my most brilliant ever law students, we were intrigued by the the idea that speech might function like a pressure valve so that someone who absolutely hated, for example, immigrants or Jewish people or minorities or, or whoever would be far safer if he just got it off his or her chest and found a, a nearby victim or story in the paper or something like that that made him matter and matter and just let fly, you N. I hate you N's, using the N, N word, in my neighborhood or in, in my university. You're all a bunch of no, no good nicks, affirmative action babies. You're taking up a perfectly decent slot that my brilliant friend who didn't get in I could have, could, have, could, have, right. could have occupied you, no good, son of a gun, you ought to go back to wherever you came from. Good riddance. The idea was that that person would be a lot safer for having gotten it off his chest and would, would thence go about being friendly and kind and generous toward all comers. That's the safety valve argument. It just doesn't hold water, as we show in our book. And it doesn't hold water because studies show this doesn't actually make social living better for especially the people targeted by this speech. It doesn't even make make the speaker safer. They they egg themselves on. They they get a a boost of adrenaline from having done that and and they're apt to do something even more dangerous afterwards. And listeners, onlookers, on seeing someone play that, that behavior and that speech, feeling encouraged and, and join in. We well, use the, the analogy of bloodied chickens in the animal kingdom. I'm, I'm sure you know that poultry farmers have observed that if a chicken gets a speck of blood, all the other chickens in the, in the herd will join in and, and peck him to death. And unfortunately, something like that happens with, with crowd behavior with, with human beings. But we mimic what other people do, and, and if it's unlovely behavior, un, un, antisocial behavior, sometimes we join in too just because they're doing it or right. because it feels good to, right. to, to do For your reference a minute ago, Affirmative Action Baby, which was, also happens to be a title by a distinguished legal mind, and so who holds this argument that basically it's a bit of a waste of time to deal with racist speech, we should be focusing on other issues, and secondly, it turns minorities into victims. So you take on this argument. Could you say a little bit about how you've thought about this? Because it it comes up in different guises quite frequently. Oh, yes. Those are two of the the conservative arguments, the the arguments from the neoconservative camp that we take up in our book, plus a a few others. The, The victimization argument is paternalistic. It says we are we are going to deny you 
the hate speech protection, the, the, uh, the rules, the tort actions, and so on, that you say you want in order to feel better and, and safer as you go about your life, because we know better. We know that if you succeeded in enacting the, these rules and having, say, your college ad, uh, adopt them, that y you would be deepening your own sense of uh, victimization. You would go around with a chip on your shoulder. You and people like you would spend a lot of your time wallowing in how, how miserable and unfair life was, when instead what you ought to be doing is, by gosh, getting out there and, and, and studying your algebra and uh, joining the debate society and, and learning how to take a few licks every now and then and assert yourself using, among other things, the, uh, the tool of, of free speech. Free speech is wonderful. You, you just don't realize it. Right. It's a paternalistic argument. It's totally false, as we show. Well, not totally false. It's largely. Large, you also talk a bit about this history, which is quite pervasive, that the free speech has always helped minorities in this country. People single out the civil rights movement. They occasionally go as far back to reach to the 19th century and say even the abolitionists at a moment when the Supreme Court never mentions the First Amendment benefited from the First Amendment. Could you say a little bit about this as also a professor of law when you see such a history that there's a kind of retrofitting of this concept of free speech to all sorts of social movements? Well, uh, that's an argument that has, has a grain of truth in it. it. It's true that speech, for example, the speech of the early abolitionists, early novels, did indeed reach the conscience of, of people who were reachable and did mobilize public opinion in the, the direction that the abolitionists wanted. So it's very During, fa famously when Lincoln says to Harriet Beecher Stowe, you're the little lady with the little book that started the war. So it's that, Uncle Tom's something, cabin. Yes. something like, like he that. He says she roused the nation's conscience in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then during the '60s, of course, we could name many civil rights leaders who who moved crowds, very large crowds. Martin Luther King's um, "I Have a Dream" speech was extremely a significant point during that movement. Caesar Chavez did, did much the same with his picketing of, of grapes. His boycott of grapes, I mean, picketing of, of stores that sold them, his speeches, his long fasts, and, and so on. But that argument overlooks one thing very neatly. The speech of people like the, the ones that you mentioned and, and I just mentioned may have been a vital sp spurs of reflection and social change. But the system of, of free speech almost always lagged behind those, those moral geniuses, so that when they spoke when they led a march through the streets of Montgomery or, or Selma, almost always their speech would land them in prison. The authorities would deem what they said irresponsible and, and, and dangerous or conducted in the, in the wrong way, in the wrong time, without a permit, or it had too much muscle. They were marching too, too vigorously or down the center of the street when they should have been over there on the sidewalk or, or, or something like that. So for their pains, for their speech, they were very often thrown into jail. They were convicted, maybe years later, by dint of, of gallant lawyering, their conviction would be overturned. But speech may have been an important ingredient in social mobilization, but the system of free speech, the laws of free speech, uh, were, were not. Right. That would come later and usually at great pain. Right. And you make a distinction between the practice of speech versus the legal conception of free speech as a legal category here. I want to get to a place I really, I so much appreciate your and Jean's book for the following reason, that you center this debate on equality. And if I can, you make this statement, say that the book points out that values of free expression and equal dignity stand in reciprocal relation. Equality, in short, presupposes speech, and conversely, any sort of meaningful speech requires equal dignity, equal access, and equal respect on the part of all who participate in a dialogue. What I find so important about your book that you put this 
conversation of speech in relation, direct relation with equality and say thinking of speech without equality actually doesn't do anything and maybe even create some kind of harm. And I can tell you I've looked at a good number of free speech books from the last few years. I have at least five on my shelf, up to 400 pages, that never once mentioned the word equality at all. So 450 pages on free speech and the word equality doesn't come up once. So the issue can't be debated, it seems, entirely without that. And I find that very so useful that you've made this such a strong, this is actually your, the whole point of that book, that, the, that equality and free speech have to be thought together. They do. And I think that it's really obvious when you think about it. If you're having a conversation with, with someone that you don't regard as, as your equal, not entitled to a hearing, uh, that's not going to be a productive conversation. The other side's position will, just won't come in or, or will, will get dismissed readily. Right now, you and I are having a, a conversation among equals. I, I respect you and, and your work, and you've at least taken the time to read mine. I, that's because you respect it. Without that, that respect of, of another person's equal dignity, equal personhood. Speech doesn't doesn't work. It's it's just a, a rant. It's it's like um, a, a sermon at a at a church, the the wrong sort of church. It, it doesn't get anywhere. But by the, the same token, without speech, legal change, social change can't happen. A speech has been a vital tool for social re- reformers, ones who wanted to expand the rights of of women, of minorities, of the slaves, of gay people, and, and so on. So the two values are in our constitution, not the original constitution, <laughs> eventually. In the amendments, the right? <laughs> yeah. They're supposed to work together, and they work best when they work together. But you're right, the, the conversation over hate speech almost always starts from the free speech position. It says, well, we have this great, overtowering value, free speech. Now, now where does equality fit in. Well, a speech that d- diminishes a person's a personhood can offend their their feelings. So how do we take account of that? Should we take account of it? It's a very small thing, isn't it? And so the conversation goes. It could equally well start from the opposite perspective. Our system is based on an equality. One person, one, one vote, we all have a, a chance to get our oriented to what kind of society we want. It's a, a democracy. It's a, a, the premise, the first position of a democracy. And so where does speech fit in into that? One might start that way, and in particular hate speech. Should that be an exception to equality? Mm, maybe it should be a very narrow exception. And so the conversation goes, depending on your starting point. Is there a way to shift this conversation? It's as if people take the amendments in order and say, well, the first is the first, and then we get to the 14th, but we don't really have time to deal with this one. And uh, someone pointed out to me, I think we have the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 14th Amendment coming up on July 15th, which they've also indicated it will not be a celebration in Washington, D.C. this year. And it's a pretty remarkable, in some ways you would think it could be a national anniversary, (laughs) a real celebration. But the 14th Amendment sort of takes a back seat. The conversation starts, at least in the media right now, much more frequently with the first position that you just outlined. Well, it it shouldn't take a a back seat. A well-accepted legal maxim holds that the the rule that, that came into effect later in time modifies the one that, that came into effect earlier. So that the way we, we look at the uh, at the time sequence uh, ought, to, ought to be that the 14th Amendment came about because, as a society, we, we saw that the original Constitution, which included free speech as a value, just wasn't working out. So, so the Thirteenth Amendment should at least stand on an equal footing with the with the first, and maybe we should think of it as a, a modification of free speech. Right, and then we have the Declaration, of course, that we hold these truths to be self-evident: all men are created equal. So we have actually another statement that's not a legal doctrine, but is a very important, powerful, foundational document. So. I actually am always surprised when equality doesn't become the first principle of these discussions and people discuss free speech and I've 
read not just books, but many, many newspaper articles that say there's free speech and hate speech, and then there's offense. And the equality doesn't enter into the equation at all. It's just these offended students and people, it's too bad when you feel bad, and then you get into the arguments that you detail in your book, the kind of neoconservative or neoliberal arguments. Can you say something about this category of offense or hurt feelings or subjectivity, which is sort of how a lot of the campus controversies are framed? Sure. Offense is certainly something to consider, but it's a, a relatively minor part of, it, of equality. The, the main issue behind the hate speech debate on sort of genes in my, in my side is the way language, including hate speech, shapes reality. It shapes social reality. It positions people and groups within the broader conversation. It doesn't merely cause the victims to feel a little bit bad. It positions them way out, outside our, our spheres of concern. It minimizes their value and their worth. It perpetrates a much deeper harm than a mere temporary, minutes-long injury to feelings. And you introduce this concept of equal dignity, which is, can you say a little bit about that word? Because in other constitutions, actually, it comes up as a solid legal premise, such as equality or freedom, that dignity is actually, in some Western democracies, use that as their, their entire premise of the Constitution. It doesn't come up in our Constitution in this way. It's kind of curious that it, that it doesn't. Most European countries, uh, particularly Germany, but also a lot of Latin American countries in Canada, uh, have dignity, equality in their constitutions or charters, and not surprisingly, many of them criminalize different kinds of, of hate speech, speech that castigates Jewish people or the Roma, denies the reality of the of Holocaust, demeans native people and the like. We are quite exceptional in having very little of, the, of that type of protection. If I use speech alone and I want to make your life miserable, I can do it. In almost every other civilized country, advanced country, I can't. I have to think what I say. And uh, If you allow me, I'll ask you as a, you're a law professor and I'm definitely not, that personal libel, defamation, and all these things, they protect me as a, a commercial person, someone who wants to conduct business. They protect, actually, my standing in the community if I want to run a business. So if you actually use your language to ruin my business, you could have some legal problems, right? But if you just demean my subjecthood, my personhood, there is no real recourse I have. So it's an interesting idea that the American subject is conceived as this kind of commercial, <laughs> right? Yes. It's, and I can protect my financial interests or my business interests, but I cannot protect my dignity in this way from this incursion. Sure. If you look at, at our blanket protection of, of free speech, the, the blanket has many rents in it. The number of exceptions is, is huge. On a good day, I, I can name a dozen. There's a libel and defamation, as, as you mentioned. If I say bad things, untrue things, about a wealthy person who has a, a monetary interest in the, in the value of, of his or her reputation, that person can sue me and force me to, to pay damages because I've, I've injured a commercially valuable part of his estates, part of his assets, which namely his good reputation. And the same is true of, of words of uh, a threat, another, another exception, words of, well, let, let's see, false advertising that, that right. might injure a very large and powerful group of, of, of consumers by hoodwinking them about the worth of a product that they are buying, say, right. a, say a car. Let's see, the words of, oh, well, they're, they're innumerable. But, but the question whether we should have a further exception for hate speech directed, say, by a group of tough, tough sort of fraternity kids out for for fun, late at night against an 18-year-old black or Latino or gay undergraduate on the campus walking home from the, from the library, the idea that, that that should be out of bounds, oh my goodness, that's, that's thought to be a, a very dangerous road. Uh, but of course, there are those, those dozen or other exceptions that pr protect the interests of, of writers, movie stars, consumers as, as a group, and so on.
So it's interesting. You, you think, why is there this reluctance to even engage in this conversation? Because I think what's great that your book opens up this conversation, and you've been doing this for a long time, uh, you know, along with other people. But there's still, a, as you said, there's a great fear. If we do this, if we regulate this one area, there'll be the metaphoric slippery slope to some kind of totalitarianism where we have no more free speech. Although we regulate all these other areas you just outlined and um, listed, and there's no real fear that from libel or blackmail or defamation or something, we'll now lose all of free speech. Yeah, most hate speech is, is, is between private individuals. Someone who's not a, a university officer, let's fly against uh, someone else and, and the university wants to have less of this going on so that people can concentrate on their studies and enjoy the, the campus status as, as other people. Most restrictions on hate speech don't consist of, of the government telling other people what, what they can say. It consists of telling private people, individual citizens, that if you do this to, to each other, we will we'll hold a hearing. And if, if you actually did it without good reason, uh, you'll have to pay a penalty. Uh, there's very little in it for the state or for government to want to expand that, that role. It, it, it's kind of a pain in the neck for campus authorities to hold all those, all those hearings. But they will do it uh, if it's necessary to, to get the minorities to feel good about coming to their, their campus rather than the one down the freeway. Right. And so they, they all do it. The, the ACLU in, invariably sues campuses that enact hate speech codes, and they generally win. But it, it's a darn singly. Something like 200 campuses continue doing it. They look, keep looking for the magic formula. They, they invite people like me to help them draft a new code that's better, that will withstand uh, scrutiny. It never works. The ACLU comes along and it gets it some court to strike it down. But the, the social urgency today, particularly with the diversification of, of our citizenry and the number of minorities growing so, so, so rapidly, and coming to campuses and job sites and so on, means that there needs to be some rules of the game. It's just like in boxing, you, you can't hit below the belt, you, you can't hit in the kidney area, behind the head. Uh, when the referee says uh, the bell goes ding, and it's gonna be 30 seconds of, of rest, there have, there have to be some reasonable rules what can do and what can say, particularly when you're, you're trying to diversify, say a college or, or a workplace. Right. Is the analogy useful to think that college is also a workplace and while students are enrolled to study and people are there to do research, but workplaces are quite regulated and Jeff Sessions or the Justice Department does not file a brief against the code of conduct at a company. So if you work at a big company or a small company in America and you are harassing one of your colleagues, you will be fired or punished or reprimanded. But if you do this as a student, you can invoke the First Amendment, the ACLU may even come to your rescue. So do you think the analogy is useful to say the university is also a workplace and therefore it has a right to regulate the behavior of its members of that community? Well, it's a, it's a study place, not a workplace, so it's a little different. But it's like a workplace in some ways, too. You have a lot of people close, close together. They see each other on a near daily, daily basis. It's more in need of, of, of protection of, of rules in, in some ways than a, than a workplace because the people who go there are relatively young. They're at their formative stages of their lives. It's hard to, to feel good about your work if, if the workplace is full of people who can say nasty things about your, about your body or your looks or your background or your, your religion or, or something like that. But it's hard, too, to keep your mind on your, on your studies if you're constantly getting emails or, or, or signs on your or door or, or people are spraying graffiti all around the place uh, that, that tell you that you should go back to, to Africa or something like that. Even Germany, people say that too. <laughs> they tell lots of people if you raise any questions, you should go back to wherever you come from. It's actually, it's, there's different valences, of course, in histories. What's your sense today, since you've been doing this important work for so long, in some ways when you help draft these kinds of rules of the game that actually your intention is to make universities better and not to restrict them in a way. 
And what's your sense of where is this headed? Is this, and in your book you indicate a little bit of that a lot of people dismiss the entire discussion, but the country is very much talking about speech, hate speech, free speech, in a maybe new way, in a, in a way that they hadn't maybe talked about for quite a while. So where do you think these conversations are going to, to go? Do you think there's some possibility that some regulation would be considered? Well, they're, they're accelerating now because, because the, the president is doing it on almost a daily basis. He has these little cutesy names for for people he, he doesn't like or who are his political components. He has no hesitation about lambasting institutions that have been thought essential for society, like like the FBI that or, or the military or the press. He calls countries that he doesn't particularly like asshole countries. He has no trouble labeling Muslims. There are 1.2 billion in the in the world. Labeling, I guess, each of them a, a potential would be terrorist who should be very carefully vetted and maybe better yet kept out entirely from this country. And Mexican people, like my father. If they want to come across the border, a rapist and terrorist, murderers. Everyone knows that's totally un untrue. The immigrants are much lower committers of, of crime than native people. They're very law abiding. This, this shouldn't be surprising to people. They, they, they come from uh, small villages in Mexico, uh, which are, are pious and Catholic, that are socially cohesive, where if you're a bad actor, if you, you shoplift or, or commit a real rape, you are marginalized, you're ostracized from that, that community. So they come here with those same uh, same instincts. They, they behave themselves. I, I'm not saying they're all little angels. A, a few of them are probably get into fights after drinking too much on a Friday night or don't watch where they're going while they're driving a car. But by and large, they are better citizens than the citizenry here. Yet the, the, the president feels perfectly free to, to castigate them and, and label them in, in, in fair ways. This is hate speech. This is untrue stuff whose purpose is to vilify and reduce in the public mind the dignity and the, the worth of, of an entire group of people, basically anybody who's, who's brown or worse yet, who's black. What I see that since the president engages in this speech, I think it behooves all of us to think about it much harder what the speech does to people in our country and in some ways to see the real impact and the effects of it rather than dismiss it as a, a minor issue that happens on campus occasionally and we can move past. Yeah, he wants to limit the speech of people like you. He wants to limit press credentials and access to the White House only to basically his friends, people who are on, on his side. He doesn't believe in, in, in free speech. He would like to, to limit your speech. He doesn't, I would bet that if he had a ready available opportunity uh, to do so, he would have exerted pressure uh, not to have our, our book published. He, he'd probably like to take a look at podcast broadcasters like, like you to, to see what you are doing to interfere with, with his, his agenda. Right. Right. Well, so for the moment, I think actually the great irony is sort of, you know, w what we're doing is exercising our free speech that thankfully, you know, we can exercise at this point. So you're absolutely right. There's a real, there's a graver threat that's looming that there's someone with enormous power who wants to restrict a whole part of discourse. Sure. So far, the conversation has centered on the terrible risk that college administrators who just want the, the campus to be peaceful, who want it to be a place where every everybody, no matter their back or their color or their last name, can come and learn and grow up confident and well-educated and take their place in society. That when people like that, like a liberal progressive college administrator, take action in the form of a hate speech rule, that's unthinkable. But now you have real hate speech emanating from the White House with real power behind it to take away licenses, to devalue journalists, and, and really damage the spirit of free inquiry that this country and your country have been based on 
now, now people are timid about that. Hardly anyone is standing up. Hardly any Republicans are standing up and saying, now, hey, wait a minute. Hate speech is now at the center of things. I point this out in, in genes in, in my book. Hate speech, it used to be at the periphery. It used to be that political speech was at the center, the sort of thing that the ACLU would get really excited about. I would get really excited about it, too. But now hate speech, how far you can go with your hate, the, the center of the discussion. Right, right. Center and the periphery have switched places. What you just said, I think, is important to say that not enough people are speaking up yet and analyzing this phenomenon, that people are still very much going along and defending some principle that probably doesn't work right now at all to analyze the situation. And doesn't work in other advanced uh, societies which have taken reasonable measures against it. We're the outlier. The, the United States is, is the, the one country whose legal system strongly resists imposition on the mighty per First Amendment. Richard, I want to thank you and Jean really for all the work you've been doing for so many years, and it's been so influential in my thinking and somewhat that you kept at it. I really want to congratulate you on this latest book. I'm going to repeat the title for our listeners, so Must We Defend Nazis? Why the First Amendment Should Not Protect Hate Speech and White Supremacy, which just came out with NYU Press in 2018. It's a very concise, very clear, and I deeply appreciate this, very non-formal, specialized book on a very, very difficult topic. So you really lay out the arguments, you give us the counter-arguments, and there's a the way out of it. So thank you so much for joining the podcast. I really appreciate the conversation. My pleasure.